Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm, I'm just sorry I can't be there in, in person, but it's very nice to meet you even in this kind of virtual space. And as Teresa said, I am writing a book on aesthetic value and epistemic gain. And some of the ideas that I'll be presenting here are ideas I'm currently working on um, exactly as, as you said, uh, um, in the context of that book. So what I'll do is I'll begin by sharing my screen so that you can see my slideshow. Is that all okay? Can you see? Good. Excellent. So our starting point uh, here today is an idea that we find already, of course, in the very first philosophical treatises or discussions on the philosophy of art and aesthetic value. So as early as Plato and, and Aristotle, of course, namely that some artworks seem capable of enriching our lives in ways that can be described in cognitive terms. That's to say, by engaging with some artworks or objects of aesthetic appreciation, we stand to make some significant epistemic gain um, by that engagement, in virtue of that engagement. So, of course, there are plenty of artworks that tend to get cited uh, in connection with this kind of discussion, uh, and including, of course, um, Dostoevsky's um, Crime and Punishment, um, Mozart's Marriage of Figaro, Sophocles, Oedipus Rex, uh, Jericho's Raft of the Medusa, and a bit more recent, uh, Toni Morrison's Beloved, Mark Quinn's Alison Lapper Pregnant, The Art Workers Coalition Question and Babies, Answer and Babies, and many more. So notwithstanding the fact that art seems capable of yielding knowledge, propositional knowledge, say, about a historical event or a person depicted, such as we see here in Napoleon or his coronation as emperor in 1804, or indeed exemplify um, a certain phenomenon or idea, um, such as Joseph Kossuth's exemplification of Plato's metaphysics, as outlined in The Republic, the main arguments for aesthetic cognitivism have focused on the kind of knowledge or understanding that we stand to, get, to gain sorry, from art. So I'm going to tell you a bit about the main arguments that have been uh, put forward in defense of cognitivism. So first we find the argument that art, and here of course especially literature, can give us a deeper understanding of our philosophical and moral concepts. Okay, so famously here, Eileen John, in, this, in her excellent paper from 1998, writes that art can give us a kind of philosophical knowledge of the nature of our concepts, particularly moral concepts, right? And famously, Martha Nussbaum writes that if we are to ensure a complete grasp of the particular requirements of certain situations, say, then moral philosophy should be supplemented with a kind of moral vision that only finds its full embodiment in some works of literature. And of course, uh, Nussbaum uses here the example of the later novels of Henry James. Okay, so a second argument in favor of aesthetic cognitivism has it that art can give us important insights into human nature and what's broadly referred to as the human condition. So here we find, of course, Sigmund Freud amongst others who writes that most psychological insights stem directly from the plays of Sophocles and Shakespeare, at least his own uh, psychological insights stem directly from Sophocles and Shakespeare. And John Gibson, who also works on this area, uh, discusses how artworks, like moral responses, can embody ways of acknowledging or responding to the values and kinds of meaning that we find in the world and grasp what it is like to be human. Now, another argument which has uh, had a lot of traction here is the idea that some art can give us knowledge of how to act in certain circumstances or how to do certain things. So to give you a, a set of examples here, for example, Greg Curry has argued that art can um, help, help us enhance our imaginative abilities. Noel Carroll and Jennifer Robinson have discussed the idea that art can educate us emotionally. 
And Nelson Goodman has even argued that art can enable us to alter the way we see the world visually. The things we actually see in the world can be altered by our kind of artistic training. And then finally, for our purposes in terms of arguments for aesthetic cognitivism, we find the idea that art can yield insights into human psychology and the what it is like, so to speak. Um, so, for example, what it is like to be tempted to give up on one's faith or what it might be like to what to undergo a divorce or what it might be like to be deceived by one's best friend, etc. So Matthew Kieran here, to give you an example of this kind of argument, uh, has held that art can morally instruct us by rendering immoral perspectives or otherwise alien moral commitments intelligible to us. So we can explore these ideas in art and we can then understand them, whereas we wouldn't have explored them in our everyday life. And again, John Gibson writes here, I think very powerfully, that drawing solely on my own experience and my preferred books of theory, I will acquire no significant knowledge of what it is like to be a victim of systematic racial oppression or an immigrant struggling to make his way to an unwelcoming country. But I can read Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man or watch Elia Kazan's America, America and in so doing, acquaint myself with a region of human experience that would otherwise remain unknown to me. So here we find instances of propositional knowledge, of knowledge how, and of course also of knowledge of what it is like. Okay? And importantly, cognitivism incorporates the phenomena described in these kind of arguments into the general value of art. Okay? and make it part of an explanation of why at least some art really matters to us. So what then of the most influential arguments against cognitivism? Well, um, these are, uh, of course, of a different kind of nature, but amongst the powerful arguments against cognitivism, we find, for example, the idea that even if we might be able to learn something from engaging with art, so granted that we could learn something from engaging with art, this knowledge is merely banal or just trivial. Okay. So um, in the famous paper by Jerome Stolnitz, we find the thought that the truths disclosed or suggested by art resemble God and variety truths. They are indeed, in other respects, even flimsier. Okay. And it's also in this text by Stolnitz that we find a second formulation um, of this um, a second kind of version or second argument against cognitivism, namely the idea that if we were able to learn from art, again, granting that if we, if we were able to learn from art, that knowledge would not be unique. Okay, so there are no truths to be gained from art that can't also be gained in other ways. So even if I were, to, were able to learn something from art, um, there's no uniqueness in the way I can learn about that thing from art. I might as well learn from some, some other source. So again, Stolnitz, uh, in Stolnitz's words, what remains of the truths inferred from classical tragedy? We might as well settle for pride goeth before a fall. For such rewards, who needs great art? Now, I'm not so worried about these challenges because I think that cognitivism has the resources to address them. I mean, the worst case scenario here is, of course, that the knowledge in question to be gained from art uh, is somehow epistemically second rate. But banal knowledge is still knowledge, right? And there's no need to endorse the uniqueness claim to secure an insight's standing as knowledge. So that doesn't worry me too much. But there is another argument, which to my mind seems more serious. And that's the idea that art can't lead to knowledge because knowledge is not merely a matter of true beliefs. These, the truths that we gain from engaging with art, if any, must be justified or reliable. And since artworks can never be reliable sources of knowledge, or they can never justify our beliefs in the required sense, there is no such case for art yielding knowledge. Art can at most suggest hypotheses. And so we find Terry Diffie here, for example, who writes also in a similar kind of tone to Stolnitz, I, I find, 
who in the face of the overwhelming cognitive achievements of the natural sciences would tough it out now with a brazen claim that art is an equal or indeed another source of human knowledge. Confronted with the phrase artistic knowledge, my mind is inclined to go blank. Now, more recently, um, Greg Curry has put forward a related point. It's not an argument for anti-cognitivism, but he is skeptical of cognitivism uh, because of what you might call arts epistemic credentials. So in his excellent and recent book, Imagining and Knowing the Shape of Fiction, Curry develops this point. If we grant that the imagination is central to our experience of fiction, as to Curry's mind, uh, we, we ought to, then the numerous hypothetical connections which supporters of cognitivism have relied on between works of fiction on the one hand and then learning truth and knowledge on the other can only at best be described as shaky. So these connections can only be described as shaky. Where, Curry repeatedly asks us, is the empirical evidence of positing these connections? So this is the underlying worry, but it leads Curry to the following point. If we were able to learn something from art, we would be capable of formulating this knowledge clearly. But this is far from always the case. So Curry writes, why, if someone says they learned so much from Anna Karenina, does it nonetheless seem poor form, kind of nearly impolite, to ask, what exactly did you learn? Okay, so the underlying assumption here is the idea that literature educates us in ways that are too subtle or too pervasive to be discovered by the crass methods of the sciences. And that is the view, or that is the position that Curry himself wants to argue against. So he writes further, that it cannot count as the generation of genuine insight, merely that people have the feeling that insight has been generated. We must offer some standards, no doubt fallible, by which to tell when people have arrived at whatever form of enlightenment is at issue confirmation that the learner has gotten it right. So what we need here is more epistemic stability of some kind and an explanation of why it is that cognitivists often find it so difficult to put what they feel they have learned into words that can meaningfully be communicated to others. Now, this is the worry that I would like to take seriously here today. But I would also like to draw your attention to how some of the goalposts, some of the requirements which Curry and others are calling for, just don't seem to match up with many aesthetic and artistic experiences. And so consequently, even if we were to find and be able to formulate such standards, they wouldn't necessarily always capture what I think it is we have in mind when we talk of the cognitive value of art. So I think we're setting up cognitivists to work very hard to meet some criteria which can't adequately explain the phenomenon at hand in the first place. So I'm going to return to that idea, but I just wanted to state that. So what I want to do is to try to um, paint an alternative way of addressing this concern in order to then further down the line reset these cognitivist parameters or the expectations that we have of cognitivists. And I want to begin by unpacking what I take to be really a cluster of questions here. Okay. There we are. Okay. So here are my set of questions. Okay. So on the one hand, when we talk about cognitivism, we can ask whether we can learn from art. So can we learn from art? And that is a separate question from what we might be able to learn from art, which again is a separate question from whether that which we seem to learn from art can really count as knowledge. So I think that much discussion about cognitivism has centered around this can and what question and whether really it is knowledge. But what about my fourth question on this list, namely, how might we learn from art? And more specifically, 
what is the role of aesthetic value in this learning process? After all, we do call this aesthetic cognitivism, uh, not artistic cognitivism. So I take it that the idea is that the aesthetic value of the artwork has at least something to do with the cognitivist case. So how might we learn from art is really a question about how the aesthetic value of something can influence whether we can learn from the object of appreciation or not. So I think it, uh, reflecting on this how question will eventually make it possible to contrast two conceptions of how we learn from art. And these are the ones, these are the conceptions that I will refer to as the subtractive and the cumulative conceptions uh, respectively. So just to connect this to an earlier point, um, it seems to me that, that uh, something like the subtractive conception lies at the heart of many anti-cognitivist challenges and perhaps even prejudice, prejudices us against the possibility of art having any kind of solid epistemic credentials. Whereas the cumulative conception, on the other hand, will, in my opinion, be able to make better sense of the kind of case that um, I think we have in mind when we talk about the relation between art and knowledge. Now, that said, uh, one caveat here, I want to be and remain a pluralist about the ways in which we can learn from art. Okay? I think there are many ways in which we can learn from art. And I would like to endorse the idea that there are several ways in, in which we can engage with art, which leads to a certain kind of epistemic gain. So it's not that subtracting or extracting uh, cog cognitive nuggets from our experience with art is not sometimes possible. But it doesn't seem to capture why we are eager to maintain a deeper connection between art and knowledge in the first place. OK, so how is knowledge or understanding supposed to come about through engaging with artworks? What is the role of aesthetic value here? Or what is the relation between the distinctly aesthetic value of the artwork and any cognitive value it may have? Now, broadly, there seem to be two ways in which the aesthetic can be understood in relation to cognitive value. And the first one here is what I refer to as the autonomy model. Here, aesthetic value and cognitive value are independent of one another and coexist peacefully in the artwork without interacting. So an artwork can have aesthetic value, it has cognitive value, but the two aren't kind of dependent um, on one another, if you like. So you might think um, that I can learn about the death of Socrates through engaging with David's painting from 1787, but that the painting's aesthetic value doesn't play a part in that learning process, rather in the same way as a non-artistic uh, photograph, right? So you might learn from this mobile phone snap that my garden was covered in snow this winter, but the aesthetic value of this picture, assuming it has any, uh, doesn't really play a part in that learning. It's the information you get from the mobile phone snap that, ah, there was snow in this garden. So basically the autonomy model has it that, is, that the aesthetic has no direct role to play in the gaining of knowledge or understanding. And what tends to result, of course, is the kind of knowledge we might also acquire in non-artistic contexts, right? So, say you might acquire propositional knowledge about the weather conditions in Uppsala this winter. So in this sense, an artwork now becomes um, just another source of information, like any non-artistic source of information. But more interesting uh, is what I will call the enabler model. Okay? So here, as I see it, the aesthetic value serves as the key to the knowledge which an artwork can yield. It unlocks, if you like, or unseals cognitive possibilities. It enables us to access the work's cognitive value. So engaging with the aesthetic qualities of the object of appreciation places us in a certain frame of mind, right? It might even activate our emotional sensibilities. It might make us more effectively receptive, priming us, if you like, or preparing us psychologically for knowledge. So, for example, um, appreciating the many aesthetic qualities of Nabokov's Lolita enables us to sympathize somewhat with Humbert Humbert. We might let our guard down a little. 
some of the moral boundaries between him and ourselves might become less distinct. And we come closer to this point of view since the narrative and Humbert's thought process is so beautifully laid out. Okay, so the aesthetic value can, in that way, kind of unlock the insight for us. And all of these aesthetic qualities enable us to understand what the internal perspective of a pedophile might be like, the extent to which we are in fact committed to our own moral principles, the depths to which our own self-deception might reach, etc., etc. So the idea is then roughly that the aesthetic does its cognitive work in this um, preparatory capacity, if you like. Now, the autonomy model, in virtue of not allowing um, aesthetic value to play a significant role in the attaining of knowledge, not only seems to reduce the artistic case to its non-artistic equivalent, say, of an informative picture or historical document, it also just doesn't get to the kind of epistemic gain that we're primarily interested in. Because if what we gain from an artwork is that Napoleon became emperor in 1804, or that my garden was covered in snow, then we might still have to address the uniqueness challenge, but the worry raised by Curry is far less pressing. Right? But of course, another reason why you might want to reject the autonomy model in the first place has to do with the underlying conception of aesthetic value, which seems to be at play here. Because the autonomy model is likely to rely on a broadly formalist account of aesthetic value, whereby aesthetic value is determined by something's formal appearance, right? A work's value is determined by its form and how that form strikes us um, perceptually. Of course, formalism has had fairly little influence in philosophical aesthetics for the last 50 years or so, since it's become pretty much impossible to account for our experience of art adequately, if our starting point is that form and meaning can successfully be separated from one another, and that aesthetic appreciation is fundamentally non-contextual. So I can come back to this point if you like, but I'm going to leave the formalist point and the autonomy model aside for now for these reasons. So what of the enabler model? Now, in this version, the enabler model is likely to rely on a broadly empiricist account, right? Um, that's to say the idea that aesthetic value is to be understood in terms of our experience of it. An object has aesthetic value insofar as it affords valuable experience. And the reasons why you might be tempted to adopt the enabler model sketched above are also connected to this empiricist account since it fits quite nicely with the traditional account of the aesthetic as necessarily grounded in first-hand perceptual experience okay, and characterized by pleasure. So the idea is that by engaging with the work on a first-hand perceptual basis, which is pleasurable, can be seen to support the structure sketched above. Now, interestingly, and I think this is interesting in, also in relation to how it affects the case for cognitivism, both A and B have come under increased pressure recently. Okay, and there's an interesting shift happening here, which I fully endorse. From the first point, um, we see increased pressure from three angles mainly. Okay, we see um, work being done in defense of the possibility of aesthetic testimony, the kind of optimists about aesthetic testimony and um, the epistemic role of aesthetic description in bona fide aesthetic judgments. Okay, we also see uh, pressure from uh, or arguments being developed in favor of the role of inferential reasoning in relation to aesthetic judgment. And we see work being done to expand the kind of objects or phenomena that can be candidates for aesthetic appreciation, including moral character and non-perceptual art. So pressure on the idea that first-hand sense perceptual experience must ground all aesthetic experience. And on the second point, the kind of the hedonic account of the hedonic approach, if you like, 
we see a number of growing challenges which focus on um, the nature of pleasure itself, whether pleasure uh, can be cognitive to a certain extent, uh, Gorodeski's point, of course, the empiricist account in general, which tends to include or diminish the importance of more contextual or knowledge-based facts, and also pressure on the idea that um, pleasure-based theories can't explain satisfactorily uh, many acts of aesthetic appreciation and aesthetic agency. And this is in connection with the idea of aesthetic motivation. So we see that, for example, in, in Macaiva Lopez's work. And what is more, the enable model, enabler model, sorry, places an emphasis on affect. Okay. Aesthetic value is reduced to the value of aesthetic experience, where that experience is held to be predominantly affective. So not only one might you want to take issue with that assumption, because of course, although some aesthetic qualities are emotional, such as being melancholic, uh, that's not true of, of all aesthetic qualities, right? But you might also wonder why these emotional qualities couldn't just do the work by themselves. I mean, why, why, why enroll the aesthetic in your explanation in the first place if really your assumption is going to be that aesthetic experience is fundamentally always uh, an effective experience? And you might also be skeptical of the enabler model because of the way in which it casts aesthetic value as a kind of instrumental value. Because at least from the way I've described it to you, Aesthetic value is reduced to play an instrumental role in artistic experience. It kind of belittles the weight of the aesthetic in art in some ways. Because on this account, once the door to cognitive value has been unlocked, if you like, uh, then the role of aesthetic value has also been played out. So, so when, when we experience aesthetic qualities of an object of appreciation, we are perhaps even in, in a state, the thought might be that we have where we have less kind of rational or cognitive control or even mastery of our own thoughts in order to be able to access these new ideas. But it seems in any case that the aesthetic value has an instrumental role to play in the unlocking of the cognitive value. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, um, is the idea of the aesthetic phenomenology here. Okay, so the aesthetic success or the experience of, art, of aesthetic value in art just doesn't seem to be a precondition for epistemic gain um, in practice. So there seems to be a mismatch here, right? When I read Crime and Punishment, say, any learning that might occur doesn't necessarily seem contingent on the aesthetic experience or in any chronology in this sense. So I don't have to be um, hit or kind of struck, if you like, by the work's aesthetic qualities in order to be able to learn from this work. So that kind of mechanism or that account of that chronology just doesn't seem um, right to me, at least not always. Now, these are not um, in and of themselves knockdown arguments. There are, of course, different versions of aesthetic empiricism and enabling, uh, or the, the, the kind of the idea of enabling um, could be cashed out in different ways. So, so that's, um, all, I'm perfectly aware of that. But what I am interested in here is these kind of gradual shifts away from the theories which underpin the idea that, first of all, aesthetic value is all about pleasure and perception. And secondly, that therefore, um, aesthetic value is conceptually entirely distinct from cognitive value or any significant epistemic gain that we might make from art. I think that distinction, that conceptual distinct, distinction, should be eroded slowly. And so the main idea that I want to explore in the rest of the paper is that engaging with the aesthetic value of art is often a far more reflective, perhaps even philosophical um, kind of thing, if you like, than we tend to assume. Okay? So I want to argue that aesthetic experience can itself be cognitively yielding. And that in that sense, at least, we can say that the process of experiencing aesthetic value can in and of itself harbor explorative thoughts, the broadening of theoretical possibilities and potential connections, the shaping and sharpening of important perspectives, all of which have a very strong char cognitive character or function. So to that extent, I want to argue that experiencing the aesthetic value of art 
can be a form of understanding itself. So in other models, we saw that aesthetic value is eventually dispensable, right, in the actual learning process. So at least after its specific task has been performed, we extract the knowledge uh, from the artwork. But my suggestion is that aesthetic value is not dispensable, it is not instrumental, because acquiring the insight or understanding is part of the aesthetic experience, and the cognitive product is therefore less apt to be easily extracted from our encounter with a particular artwork when we cease to engage with that artwork aesthetically. So some epistemic gain can be understood as part of the yield of engaging with the aesthetic value in art, where that gain is part of the aesthetic response to that artwork. So think here in terms of a kind of bear hug analogy, right? Where it's the aesthetic doing the bear hugging in order to absorb the cognitive into its fold. So it's a case of infusing the aesthetic with cognitive potential. It's a case of trying to revise our concept of aesthetic value so as to make room within it for something we tend to think of as separate from it. Now, I worry that because there are certain things that we can learn from art, which can successfully be articulated in propositional terms, for example, that we have assumed that everything that looks like knowledge or indeed feels like knowledge in connection to art must in fact be thought of as conceptually distinct from the work's aesthetic value and therefore again also liable to have to meet certain epistemic standards as per Curry's point or as per Curry's claim. So what I'm going to do now is to talk you through an example and then I'm going to return to the main idea I'm then going to raise one possible worry and just briefly end by listing some uh, advantages to my proposal. So remember here, of course, that my goal is to try and explain why there seem to be some epistemic gains, which simply can't be taken out or abstracted away from great artworks such as Anna Karenina, even though they still kind of remain cases of knowledge or understanding. Okay, so let's look again at David's death of Socrates. So how might we learn from this painting? What do we see? Well, as we know, Socrates has been sentenced to death by poison. Socrates is calm. He's sitting upright on a bed, one hand extended over the ominous cup and the other pointing up towards the light, the higher metaphysical plane. He's surrounded by other men of varying ages, most showing emotional distress, unlike himself. And the man handing him the cup looks the other way, incapable of finding Socrates' composure. Another young man is clutching Socrates' thigh. And then an elderly man sits at the end of the bed, slumped over and looking in his lap. This is Plato. Only Socrates and Plato, dressed in white, contrasting with the other colors, are serene. Rather than trying to flee, Socrates uses his impending demise as a final lesson for his pupils. The scene like this, the work doesn't seem very cognitively fruitful. We already know many of these historical facts, and so you might even agree with Stolnitz that the painting is epistemically trivial. What's more, it actually contains several historical inaccuracies. So the man you see in blue leaning against the wall, Apollodorus, is included even though he's said to have been sent away by Socrates for displaying too much grief. So Socrates, at the time of his death, death was a man of 70 years old. And I think it's fair to say that his face and his body, um, as depicted here, is fairly idealized. Now, Plato, on the other hand, was a young man at the time. And also we see that uh, 
um, David has changed the number of people present in this painting and the scene to echo the same amount of people present at Leonardo da Vinci's painting of Jesus's Last Supper. So, so much for the idea that art is a reliable source of significant knowledge, you might say. But what happens when we look at this painting, bearing in mind that it is a work of art rather than a direct source of historical knowledge created with certain kinds of aesthetic qualities and artistic goals and aesthetic and artistic ambitions. And of course, that it ought to be viewed as such. Now, perhaps the first thing to note is the flat wall behind the men. This is not a coincidence. David's intention is to present the painting as an ancient Roman frieze thereby invoking the particular way of looking appropriate to friezes, namely that they are read mainly from left to right, but sometimes also from right to left. So already here in submitting ourselves to the work's aesthetic qualities, a new aspect of the world of the painting opens up for us. So if we begin, if we look at this painting beginning, kind of going from right to left, what do we see? First, we see several men in distress. Something terrible is clearly happening. Right? Then we see Socrates still discussing philosophy and the immortality of the soul. Then we see the poison, which will have to be drunk. And finally, the pensive resignation of Plato. But if we look at it from left to right, we begin by seeing Plato as an old man, thinking back to this event. He is the narrator, just like in the dialogues describing Socrates' trial and death. The depicted scene plays out as a memory, in the words of one art historian, vibrant, beautiful, and bittersweet. The painting is now about the meeting of the minds of these two philosophical giants. By submitting to the work's aesthetic character, that's to say its composition, its aesthetic qualities, the symbols, gestures, and traditions which endow them with so much meaning, we begin to see the new dimensions of the world that is represented here. Also, David signed this painting in two places. He put his full signature under Crito, the young man clutching Socrates' thigh, and he put his initials under Plato, his initials under Plato are a reference to the fact that the story comes from Plato and a thanks, if you like, for the inspiration. His fuller signature under Crito means that this is the character whom the artist identifies with most. Crito is clutching Socrates' thigh and in this way, David designates himself as a man who likewise clutches at the morals and values that Socrates represents. David, the quintessential neoclassical artist, wanted the viewer to understand that reading Plato is the key to keeping the soul of ancient Athens alive. Again, it's by noticing the aesthetic merits that we begin to grasp what the cognitive dimension of this painting amounts to. You might say that our understanding of the tragedy of Socrates' death is directly in proportion with the artwork's aesthetic value. It's the painting's aesthetic value which endows the notion of tragedy with substance. And it's this conceptual grasp of the tragedy depicted in the painting, which allows us to link this epistemic experience with our sense that the death of Socrates represents the tragic betrayal of philosophy's highest ideals, including the truth, the value of truth and knowledge itself. So, it is only, I believe, in this aesthetic contemplation that we can grasp the full dimensions of the tragedy. We have to enter the world of the painting to see its force. So the aesthetic pull of the painting is inseparable from the desire to engage with these ideas. What the aesthetic experience yields is a very rich theme for reflection. So, Let's look again at Curry's question. Why, if someone says they learned so much from Anna Karenina, it nonetheless seems poor form to ask, what exactly did you learn? So on my account, artworks invite us to inhabit a certain perspective. But some things 
can't be seen or grasped or fully understood outside that perspective. So if at least some of the cognitive yield of art is connected to our aesthetic experience of it in the ways that I have suggested, then certain aspects of that yield will be able to be taken out of that experience, but others won't. And when we try with the latter, they seem to lose their epistemic credentials. So if we strip the epistemic gain from its aesthetic context, it loses its very character. Now, why call this aesthetic value or aesthetic experience? Well, I think it's an accumulation of moments in which the aesthetic character of the experience um, is essential. Does it lack all sensory components? Certainly not. Does it lack all pleasure? Certainly not. But neither is it an exercise which is primarily knowledge oriented. It is playful and it is interpretative, often probing and explanatory. So its aesthetic value, since it involves engaging with the artwork's aesthetic qualities on the work's own terms, not with the aim of raiding war and peace for historical details about the Napole Napoleonic Wars, or indeed the death of Socrates for information about the poisoning of the philosopher. And this is why I think we also go back and revisit paintings such as these, right? Even now that we feel that we have made some epistemic gain. My guess is that you would quite like to see that painting again right now and to have another look and to continue engaging with it in that way. So my basic idea here is that experiencing the artwork aesthetically keeps that gain, the epistemic gain, as to say, alive, so to speak. So finding the work beautiful is what keeps the insight alive and also open to continued questioning and exploration and connection making. In other words, finding the painting beautiful is the ground for maintaining the belief that the death of Socrates is indeed tragic. Now, recall the distinction I mentioned earlier between two conceptions of what it is we do when we learn from art. I said that underlying many anti-cognitivist arguments, we find what I call this subtractive conception or this focus on extracting cognitive nuggets from our engagement with particular artworks. Now, this conception uh, might well yield cognitive results such that we can meet at least most of the conditions set by the anti-cognitivists, right? It could be possible to express or formulate clearly if need successful. It would be more likely to meet um, established reliability criteria, uh, but it would also face the difficulties to do with being banal okay, and not unique. And this then to be contrasted with the cumulative conception. Okay, now what is this idea? What is the idea that the way in which we learn from art, at least sometimes, is better understood in terms of an accumulation? What would be the main features of this cumulative conception? Okay, so here, here's what I think so far on this question, and I look forward to your comments and suggestions uh, in our discussion. But first of all, it seems that a main, an important feature of a cumulative conception would be that epistemic gain from one artwork is not necessarily the work of one single novel or film, poem, uh, etc. Now, works of art, um, to elaborate on this idea, works of art are not always capable of imparting or conveying these kind of individually packaged insights that uh, people like Curry seem to be after. Instead, we learn from the cumulative effects of the work, sometimes um, by the same author, such as when we learn about loneliness from reading V.S. Naipaul's Half a Life in conjunction with the sequel Magic Seeds from three years later, but also by reading, for example, Naipaul's Half a Life and also in connection with that, engaging with Kutzia and Conrad, and then seeing bridges, common influences, and thematic echoes between these three authors. 
So, of course, such snowballing, I think, can also very interestingly occur across art forms, such as when we understand something about the universal fate of refugees, when we join up, so to speak, Jericho's Raft of the Medusa with forensic architecture's liquid traces, the left to die boat case. Or indeed, when we join up or connect um, Toni Morrison's Beloved um, with BLM uh, murals, for example. So that's the first feature I would like to um, describe this cumulative conception in terms of. My second central feature is the idea that the epistemic gain from art can't meaningfully be disentangled or isolated from other previously acquired items of knowledge, also from non-artistic contexts. Right? So beyond the obvious psychological point that we don't come to artworks with kind of blank mental slates, a work of epistemic interest should be seen as a solicitation, as an overture, uh, perhaps even a provocation to identify new cognitive possibilities, also building on one's own personal experience. So what I read, well, sorry, what I learn from, for example, reading Shikibu's um, The Tales of Genji is largely dependent on, for example, whether I have been to Japan myself. And that, of course, can never be identical to anyone else's private cognitive combinations or constellations, which, of course, may make it seem banal or difficult to articulate to other people. I think that's fairly um, obvious. And then my third uh, feature here of the cumulative conception uh, is that the epistemic gain that we stand to gain from art depends to a great extent on the listener, viewer or reader considered as an epistemic agent. Okay, so what I mean by that is that engaging with art can serve as an invitation to take control of our own epistemic trajectories. So what we learn from engaging with fiction, for example, depends largely on what we actually do, so to speak, with the epistemic potential of the work. It's up to us to connect the cognitive dots. And this is often a gradual process, right? Prolonged over time. So I might not actually know what I am learning or why, what I am in the process of learning at a particular time, T1, and the character of my epistemic gain might also evolve quite significantly between T2 and T3. But I think that much of the cognitive worth of art lies in, in our own propensity to put the work to its best possible epistemic use. And I think that when we say that books or films, for example, can stay with us for a long time, I think this is an approximation um, of what that can mean. So just to conclude, um, I think further exploring and developing this account of aesthetic value, the blurring of the conceptual boundaries between the aesthetic value and the cognitive value of artwork, the bear hugging of aesthetic value in order to absorb at least some cognitive components, um, can lead to the following advantages, or at least open up for alternative ways of, for example, thinking about the role of aesthetic value in art-based learning processes. It can open up for new ways of developing standards of confirmation for what it might mean to get something right and the ways in which art can benefit us epistemically. Also of offering non-hedonic explanations of art's value and of incorporating more up-to-date accounts of aesthetic value as we saw in relation to the empiricist account or the criticism of the empiricist account. I think there might also be uh, possibilities in terms of explaining why the aesthetic doesn't seem to operate on some kind of on-off button basis <laughs> during our experiences of artworks. And finally, uh, it opens up possibilities for capturing why we are eager to maintain this connection between art and knowledge in the first place. Thank you very much for your attention.